welcome. This is actually our first lecture this semester, and I am very pleased to introduce Carolyn Crockett, who's joining us tonight. Uh, she is a professor of urban history, public policy, and planning at MIT. Her PhD is from the American Studies program at Yale. Um, she has a master's degree from, uh, of science in geography from London School of Economics and also a master of arts and religion from the Yale Divinity School. Um, but one of the things I love about her bio is that she's also somebody who rolls up her sleeves and gets her hands dirty in government and policy. Um, she served as the director of economic policy and research and director of small business development for the city of Boston and was also the city's first, the city of Boston's first chief of equity. I would love to hear more about what a chief of equity does. Um, it's great to have the title chief in almost anything you do. We don't have the title chief really in academia. Um, her talk this evening is titled The Road Less Traveled, Historic Lessons or Not Learned, I guess, um, oh. from Defeated Highways, Archival Adventures and Planning the Future of U.S. Cities. But her larger work focuses on large-scale land use changes in 20th century American cities, um, and she also examines the social and geographic implications of structural poverty. I know many of you who are in the first year of history and theory class read some of Carolyn's work today, and um, looking forward to hearing your questions at the end. Carolyn will present for a while, then we'll have some time for Q&A. So please join me in welcoming Professor Car Carolyn Crockett to this class. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you. Well, good evening. I have lots of mics, so I hope you can hear me. There are lots of amplification systems making this conversation possible. It's so nice to be here uh, on a, a Monday night, just trying to dig in a little bit to some big questions that I know have been really keeping me engage for a long, long time. I, I have to admit that I am a, I have, I'm a big Penn fan. Uh, when I was in high school, like a million years ago, University of Pennsylvania was like the it spot. So every time I come here, I feel like excited. I feel like I'm still trying to get it in. Um, I do feel a genuine sense of community. So it's really nice to be welcomed so warmly and, and, and very wonderful to be a, a, a part of one of these great urban intellectual communities that I know you all hold here in Philly. So, um, so yeah, I'm Carolyn. I, um, I, I, I sometimes think of myself not quite as a historian, but someone who has lots of history-related questions. But I have to tell you that today when I was at the airport, I was waiting uh, to get on my flight, and they called another flight for Philadelphia that was leaving, and, and it was a flight 1776. And when I heard that year, I thought to myself, oh my gosh, are they calling out years that are really significant to like American history and cities is like a thematic calling of, of, of planes and gates? And I thought to myself, only someone who is super obsessed with history would even think that way, whether they consider themselves a historian or not. So I, I come to you as someone who thinks about time, who thinks about space, and has so many questions about how we use space, um, how we think about time, not just in a way that looks backward, um, as often historians do, but uh, people who think about the future of, of time. Uh, because I teach in a planning department, uh, I think that sometimes planners are, and there are many in this room, um, think a lot about the future, think a lot about what could be, and often bring uh, themselves to a, a slate that's a little bit invisible. And so I wonder if we could have a much more robust understanding of time, a much more robust sense of what the future could be if it is really informed by what we think of as past, but which is often not truly past. So for tonight, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some lessons I think that I'm still learning about uh, what it has meant to, to build roads in this country, what that has meant specifically in, in the city of Boston, which is my home. And uh, I wrote this book uh, to try to tell this story, and, and I learned a lot more than uh, a story about roads and a story about fighting roads in the, in the middle of the 20th century. But I learned a lot about how people tell stories, and I learned a lot about how people share 
information, strategies, uh, 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 memories, dreams, and hopes. And so this project really is about that. So um, I'm looking forward to chatting a little bit, and I'm mostly looking forward to your questions and also hearing a little bit more about what, what's, on, what's on your minds and hearts here. So uh, what can I tell you? This story for me starts with this image which is an image of Mary Parkman Peabody. That's the, the woman you see in the center of, of the, the image. She's holding a balloon. And I'm sure you can see that that balloon says, Homes, Not Highways. Uh, this is uh, January 25th, 1969, a historic day that I had read about. Um, it, it was a day of people coming together from all over uh, the, the greater Boston region to protest the brand new governor, Francis Sargent, who we'll see in a minute, and to tell this governor that they did not want a highway. They did not want a road coming through their neighborhood. They did not want a road coming through their communities. They wanted homes, not highways. And when I heard this story, I, I just wondered, well, who would show up in front of the State House that you can see, the Massachusetts State House with its glorious gold dome? And what would make someone like Mary Parkman Peabody, who uh, was not just the previous governor's mother, Endicott Peabody, so I was sort of curious that what would make the governor's mom kind of come out and protest uh, against the new governor? That seemed kind of maybe, I don't know, rude or bad form or kind of what was going on. Um, and it's clear that Mary Parkman Peabody uh, was a very, a, a very respectable, sort of her chin is up, a uh, well-heeled, um, suburban woman, and next to her is a friend of hers with her leopard pillbox hat, you can see. And so again, who, who was coming together um, for this demonstration that brought all these different people out? And it just began for me as a very simple question. What happened? Who was there and why? And it was a question that kind of came to me in a seminar. So watch your seminars and these seminar papers because the questions can grow become papers, become books, sort of change your life, you become a professor, it can, can go crazy. So uh, that's kind of how this thing started for me, looking at this picture. And on this same day, uh, this is another image, an archival image, uh, showing what this coalition of people looked like. So about 2,000 people show up on the steps of the Massachusetts State House on January 25th, 1969, and you can see them there. You can see on your far right side, there is Governor Francis Sargent looking quite dapper in a, in a suit, which was fashionable. And at that moment, he had been governor for about uh, a little bit more than two weeks. And if you look at the people who are in the crowd, what would you say about their faces? How do they look? Excited? Impressed? Not at all impressed. Not impressed by his suit, not impressed by his face, the, the speech he's trying to make. You can see right in the front, even the altar boys, they don't look impressed at all. So it, it's, it's striking to me that you already have this crowd that's on edge. And so more than a, a celebration, obviously, of this new governor, you have a group of people who are pretty pissed off and who are trying to figure out if they can persuade this new governor to change course. This is the, this is the pe People Before Highways Day, which was an official day of people coming out to protest this road. They have been up fighting against this road for about four or five years now. Uh, this guy becomes the governor when the previous governor, who was pro-highway, Governor Volpe, gets swooped away to Washington, D.C., when President Nixon becomes president, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and so a new person is there. And the idea of this multiracial regional coalition uh, coming together, the idea is to push him to change his position. And so no one is impressed. Uh, you have this incredible grouping of folks who have been mobilizing for years. And the question I had is, what changed his mind? On this day, he felt like he was going to convince them that his position was fine, that he was excited to work with them and have a conversation, which is laudable, notable. Uh, but this day, the entire thing still hung in the balance. We weren't sure which way this was going to go, and the conversation was just about to get very interesting. And so this is where my book kind of takes its cue. 
And so I get a lot of uh, inspiration um, and guidance from some books that you know, Tom Segrew's book, uh, The Origins of the Urban Crisis, which talks quite a lot about Detroit and gets us to ask ourselves, what is this question of the crisis moment of the 1960s? What is that? Uh, Arnold Hirsch's book, Making the Second Ghetto, really powerful work thinking about Chicago and, and understanding what housing and new tensions around housing production in the post-war period look like. And certainly Tom, Tom Lewis's Divided Highways, a book that really puts in front and center this discussion about the interstate highways. And then here comes this little volume <laughs> sliding up on the side, which is my own attempt to take some of these stories and put front and center the voices of activists, the voices of residents, really toiling with the remaking of their communities, the remaking of their city in a very different period. This is not a story that's about suburbs. It's not a story, it's not a story about the entire nation. It's a story about a particular city, Boston, a city that fought interstate highway expansion and won, even though it wasn't really clear to lots and lots of people, even today, how they won. And so for me, as someone who thinks about grassroots organizing history, that thinks about progressive organizing, whatever that even means sometimes, for, you, for those of you that follow those kinds of stories, what you know is that oftentimes when you protest, oftentimes when you rally, oftentimes you, when you come together, you lose. And the reason why you protest or you fight is not because you're necessarily going to win, as people had explained to me when I interviewed them, but, but because you feel like it's the right thing to do. You have to. And so in the story of the people before highways fight in Boston, what's remarkable about this story is that people actually did come out and they actually did win and they actually did defeat inter interstate highway expansion. The issue is when I start to talk to people, people who were planners, people who were politicians, people who were organizers, people who lived in neighborhoods that would have been affected by this road, People said, I said, well, well, how did you win? What did you do? People said, oh, we demonstrated. We went to the state house. We wrote letters to the governor. We talked. We met in kitchens. We did this. We did. And I said, but what? What was the order? What was the sequence? What actually happened? And there was no understanding of what folks actually did. And so for me, I felt like that was an invitation to think about writing down the story, researching it, because there was, again, the unbelievable reality that you actually won this fight. But then on the other side, there's no sense of how. And so the story, uh, this book is absolutely trying to chronicle and document the playbook. What did it take to bring people together? What did it bring? What did it mean to bring someone like Mary Parkman Peabody out? How did you have black nationalists? How did you have radical priests, altar boys? How did you have moms, parents, students, anti-war activists? How did you have all these people come together in solidarity and stop this over time and in fact change the governor's decision, his mind, so that he would say we were wrong, which was the front page headline of the, of the Globe when in fact Francis Sargent changed his mind. And so I can't think about this story or we can't really think about the interstate highway system and its fight without, think, without taking ourselves back to that moment when it all began. And so here, uh, on your right, you have a picture of uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower, President Eisenhower, signing the Federal Aid Highway Act. It's actually a little bit of a botched photo because this picture is actually not him signing the Federal Aid Highway Act of 1956. This is him signing the Federal Aid Highway Act of 1954. On the, it's a longer story, but on this day, June 29th, 1956, he was actually sick. He was in the hospital, so there was no photo of him. Uh, but they did have a press release, but just for dramatic sake, I'm offering you this photo from 1954 so you get the feel. So there was a signing. This was a big thing. Legislators flanked him. He was excited. Uh, and we get this thing called the Federal Aid Highway Act, which actually releases all of this money for the interstate highway system. Today, this interstate highway system is about 41, 46, actually 46,000 miles of roads and are really significant for reorganizing the country, for putting together a very solid economic uh, and mobility infrastructure at a time when the country needed it. On the other side of the screen, you see uh, George Hayes, Thurgood Marshall in the middle, and James Nabrick. 
These are the lawyers for the NAACP's Legal Defense Fund, and they are celebrating the incredible momentousness of the Brown decision on May 7, 1954. Many of you will know that the Brown decision was significant because it was the decision that outlawed uh, separate but equal. And so up until that moment, segregation had been the law of the land in public schools. The Brown decision is significant because it, 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 it not only is it a, a radical Supreme Court decision that was brilliantly argued by these three lawyers, but it absolutely becomes the high watermark for the civil rights movement at this time. So at the same time that you have the federal interstate highway system expanding, growing due to funding, you also have the urban renewal process, which is ripping up cities. Uh, I know that my colleague Francesca has written brilliantly about what that means to think about this moment of change, of destruction. You have all of these changes, all of these motions to actually reorganize the physical landscape of cities and towns across the United States. Just at the time where two years before, the Brown decision, I argue, was pushing us into a very different kind of spatial, racial, and social organization. And so what does it mean when you have these two very different legal frameworks organizing the country and creating attention? So you have this, this image of the interstate highway system, as I mentioned, 54, now 46,000 miles of roads crisscrossing the country and holding it together, valued at about $500 billion today. And so it, at this moment, uh, when the, the Federal Aid Highway Act is signed in 1956, this means progress. This means you can move around. This means we can move goods. This means uh, that the country is connected in ways that it had not been before. But what I would offer to you is not only this idea of connectivity, not only this idea of, of, of what has been also argued as this automania, this car craze that would rip through the country, but considering also many places where it's marked by these yellow uh, crosses where there were protests, where there are people who said they did not want highways, they did not want interstates because they were destroying their communities, they were bringing automobiles to many communities that did not need or want automobiles. And so obvious, obviously, we're also looking at what was the beginning of a doubling down on car-based culture, on a fossil fuel-based economy that was very much driven by uh, social policy, very much driven by the automobile lobby, the petroleum lobby, and so forth. And so as we think about places like Boston, places like Seattle, places like Miami, New Orleans, where there were on the ground protest actions, we have to really ask ourselves, what did we learn? What was worth it in this moment? And what did communities do to push forward? So this is a map showing what the, the, the highway plan would have looked like in Boston. And so for you, the dotted lines represent the, the plan, the idea, the proposed plan by the Department of Public Works. So for uh, what's, what'll make this easy to understand is that on your left side, uh, the dotted lines that are showing the Northeast Expressway um, and then going down to the Southwest Expressway are showing you the connective dots that are trying to connect Boston as a region into the interstate highway system of I-95. And so many of you know, I-95 is a 1900 mile road that snakes its way all the way down the eastern seaboard, but there are two breaks in that road, two places where the road actually does not come through. So you can come like today, I could come right into Philly on I-95, I can get into New York, I can get into all of these cities, but there are two places where that is not true. Does anyone know what are the two places where there's a break in I-95 from Maine to Florida? You can have a you have a guess kind of in front of you. That's a Boston is one. Yes, you cannot get into Boston downtown on I-95. You got to go around. You got to get on the pike. You got to get on Route Two. You don't know this. It's okay. You'll you're spared. But that's true. Another city. What's the other place? Yeah, Washington D.C. Not quite. Yeah, those belts in Baltimore are confusing, but not quite, if only so, right? The beltway is very, very overwhelming. It's actually Portland, Maine. So if you've been to Portland, you know there's continuing in this, it continues to be a battle in terms of funding and political will to close up 95's loop on and through Portland. 
So it's interesting to think about what happens on the ground when one of these roads is promised for your community. And so when we look at this, it seems like, all right, it's interesting. Uh, we see some lines, we see some, some what could be some roadways. This is an example of, of basically hub and spoke. And so uh, you have a, a radio set of roads that were planned for Boston. It's, this plan actually was birthed in 1948. And men, much of the development of this road had been built into 1965. And so what you're seeing, I'm going to walk over here and make it easier. This dotted line becomes what's so significant. So this road here is Route 128. The road of I-95, you see it there, was built all the way, and the only, what was left was the last 10 miles of this road. And so a lot of the, arg, the fight, the battle, had to do with these dotted lines coming right into the, the middle of the city, surrounded through an inner belt, coming through Cambridge, Boston, uh, Somerville, and Brookline. This would become the fault line for these battles. And so for those of us that like to draw, make pretty maps and things, uh, these things look great, right? It's like this is the idea. This is going to bring, uh, it's going to bring the region into modernity. It's going to bring the region into the interstate highway system by connecting Boston, Somerville, uh, Cambridge, and Brookline into this interstate system into I-95. And so the plan had sat on a shelf. Uh, had sat on pages for years and years and years. And it wasn't until President Eisenhower signs off on the Federal Aid Highway Act in 1956, as we just saw, that now the rubber can literally hit the road because now there's money. So a plan that had been dusty, a plan that had just been sitting there waiting, a bunch of dots on a map, conversation, now it gets real. And so the, the gray scale or the gray background map is showing the inner belt or the inner circle of this road. And you can see how that those dotted lines are moving through neighborhoods, moving through Cambridge, moving through part of MIT campus, I can say, uh, moving through parts of Boston, the South End, through very densely populated uh, working class neighborhoods, uh, neighborhoods populated by people of color, uh, a large black community in, in Roxbury, a large Latinx community in JP. And so all of this planning and all of this thought was exerting force on those neighborhoods. And so when I started this project, I started talking to people in neighborhoods about what they remembered uh, and what happened. And what I was struck by was through in a number of my interviews, people continued to talk, about the, talk to me about the West End clearance. Does anyone know this story of the West End? Clearance in Boston? No? OK. So it, it is uh, chronicled uh, by Herbert Gans in a book called The Urban Villagers, where Gans really takes on the story of what was in this community. This is one of the early examples of, of slum clearance. I use air quotes because slum is still such a problematic word when you're talking about someone's home. Uh, and so this was a big modernization project celebrated supposedly, uh, by many, many people, by planners, by City Hall, by the mayor. Uh, this clearance uh, notice went out in 1958. So you can see in the, in the foreground there this community. And then by 1959, that smear of dirt that you see on the other side, that is where the community was completely erased, quite literally. So uh, in 1958, in April, letters went out to the people who were living in the West End to tell them, uh, that, the, that the city of Boston had seized their land and that they needed to remove themselves. By May, at the end of school, people started to start to move. By the end of the summer, uh, many families are starting to relocate themselves. There was no real provision for relocation. There was no money given to people. Uh, and then by December of that year, more than half the community had cleared out. And then as you can see, by 1960, by 1959, the community was empty. It's now uh, the, the site for lux luxury, very, very high-end luxury housing, condominiums, and a uh, complex for Mass General Hospital. What's interesting to me about this story uh, is not only that it's atrocious, but it, this is the way that urban renewal, particularly in the early days, worked. You just decide this land is a problem. Uh, on the back of one of these, uh, another aerial photograph of this community, the word overcrowded was written uh, by a planner uh, in one of the archival documents, I, on, on one of the archival images I saw, and that was the deal. It's overcrowded, it's dirty, it's done. 
And so that kind of calculus and that kind of sense of understanding or that, that, that way that planners were just deciding whose community was worthy or not um, uh, was not typical, uh, was, just, just a, was, actually, was actually typical uh, in Boston in so many communities. So uh, what's striking to me is that when I talk to people and I want to ask them about the highway plan that was coming for 19 in the 19, in 1966 and 1965, the Southwest Corridor Highway or the Inner Belt, they want to talk to me about the West End. And I kept saying, no, no, I'm not talking to you about the West End. I want to know about this other road 10 years later. And so what I learned over and over was that people who experience this level of clearance and displacement uh, experience a trauma a collective trauma, even for people who didn't live in the West End. I talked to people who were in many other neighborhoods uh, in the city, and they all talked about the way the West End was something that should never happen again. And so what that helped me understand was the ways that collective trauma, collective memory, uh, can be a, a source of not only knowledge and information, but something that actually helped to motivate people 10 years later uh, not even 10 years later, uh, five and six years later, to stop this other highway that was coming, this other clearance that was coming. And so as a researcher, I had to pay attention to the way that this story, even though it was not the focus of my study, the way that this story was exerting a particular kind of pressure, uh, was doing a, a, particular, a particular kind of uh, politicization for communities in Boston that felt like this was wrong and would never happen again. And so what was being circulated were images like this. This is an image, uh, a, a, a schema from the Department of Public Works from 1962. It's a map showing, uh, again, this, this inner belt. So the outer loop, that white kind of spaghetti looking thing, uh, is, is, one, is Route 128, which uh, is one of the first uh, limited access circumferential roads in the United States that becomes really important in the post-war period because of all of the technology companies that are developed, many of them in partnership with uh, MIT, including Polaroid and Raytheon and so on and so forth. But a lot of the, a map like this is sort of, it's interesting because you see these roads, you see the Southwest Expressway, you see the Inner Belt, you see the Northern Expressway, and these, these lines just kind of float on a page. They seem sort of innocuous. They say, okay, so we're going to plan these roads. This is, a, again, a, a schema from 1962. And these were the ways the Department of Public Works were circulating plans for this new highway that was to come. And then planners, some of them from MIT, some of them from Harvard, some folks who were from the neighborhoods, and some, some priests are organizing and talking. And what they decided to do was to take something like um, a street level map, like a Rand McNally map, like a map that actually shows not just lines in the sky, sort of how that other map was sort of presenting itself, but a, a map that would show the, the proposed highway alignment, which at the top of this slide you can see is the hatches on, in yellow. That's showing you what the proposed, the state's proposed plan for this highway would look like in Cambridge. These are street level images of Cambridge. And then the red line, the green line, and the blue line are organizers suggesting other ways to shift the highway. So originally, these are some of the earliest images that were circulated in 1965, organizers trying to get people, residents in Cambridge to kind of take seriously the threat of this road and to understand that this road might possibly be threatening not just some ethereal version of the sky, but could be on your street. And by creating these maps and circulating them in the Cambridge Chronicle, which is a weekly newspaper you can see there, these organizers and activists started to put a, a movement in place. Because when people saw these maps, all of a sudden, people said, wait a minute, Albany Street, uh, Vassar Street, I live near there. That's near my job. My kid goes to, school, goes to school down the street. And so just like that, with the technology of a very, very simple map, it's not fancy, it's not produced by CAD or like some kind, it's not. This is how the movement in Cambridge really began, by these maps being in circulation. And at the same time, you have people pushing their way out into the street again, thinking about a new kind of set of space claims that they wanted to put on the state, put on the governor, put on local government. Uh, these are two images that are archival images from 
at the Boston Globe that are showing uh, uh, what happened in the city of Boston on the heels of Dr. King's assassination. And so in the city of Boston, there were no riots, there were no protests, there were no burnings uh, on the other side of Dr. King's murder. People came to the state house very quietly to have this vigil. What's notable is you see uh, the person is holding a sign that says black is beautiful. This is at this moment in uh, 1968, this is a very radical act. You notice the wording is not colored, it's not Negro, it's black. Black as a particular kind of, of social identity, as a particular kind of political identity, making a new kind of claim, saying it's beautiful, saying it's present, saying it's demanding to be recognized by the Massachusetts State House. And just a few months later, about nine months later, we go back to that protest that we talked about with Mary Parkman Peabody in front of the State House. also. This is the People Before Highways Day protest, also pushing a new kind of politics on the ground in front of the governor, uh, making a new kind of demand, not just demanding to occupy space, but demanding to design space to determine what kind of policy would lead to the creation of the kind of space that many of the people in this movement were speaking about. And so what's interesting to me is the way that these different movements actually are intersecting. The civil rights movement, uh, a newer generation of, of activists moving more toward black radicalism, uh, the presence of the Black Panther Party in Boston would be significant to, uh, to speaking to a much more radical politics a politics that was not about racial integration. And so with the death of King, you have a younger group of activists saying that for them, racial integration is no longer the high water mark, that they're much more interested in community control, that they're much more interested in directing their destiny, directing what the plans could be, and having protests like this where actually ad, uh, activists who are a part of uh, black nationalist movements uh, including the Black Panther Power, uh, Black Panther Party, including the Black United Front, folks who would be in partnership with Mary Parkman Peabody to visit and speak to the governor. So this is notable. At the very same time that folks are trying to put pressure on the governor uh, to stop the road, clearance had begun in Boston. And so you have neighborhoods like this who had experienced clearance from 1966 as the city and the state were preparing for this road. And so here, uh, we're in a community uh, on the edge of Roxbury, which is uh, traditionally an African-American community, and in Jamaica Plain, which is a Latinx community there. You have uh, here a gardener, Carmenza von Stad, who was leading this group called, um, who had formed something called the Southwest Corridor, wait for it, community farm, yes. So not a road but a farm and folks trying to figure out what to do with this vacant land. And you can see, uh, if you note those, those telephone lines and some of the infrastructure around that's reminding you that this was a neighborhood. Those would be lines that would be going to people's homes. Uh, they were powering the community. Um, and so you see folks who are literally in what is almost a wasteland in their neighborhood trying to garden, trying to grow uh, beans, uh, collard greens, herbs, uh, some people using some of the things that some of the, the, the recipes and foods from their communities and families um, and turning that land that had been dormant for some time as these battles are going on to figure out how to make it productive and how to determine what kind of land use uh, the community would prioritize um, and that that prioritization did not look like a highway. And so as I'm looking through archival images and trying to tell these stories. I'm also on Facebook. <laughs> I'm trying to talk to uh, members of the uh, SDSers, uh, Students for a Democratic Society, and talking to them about what, what are these connections between these different movements. And so people were weighing in here. I'm also trying to look through archival images of how the, uh, how the, uh, the community used to look, different kind of transit systems. This was an, there was an elevated train that was in, uh, in the vicinity of where this highway was gonna be. So I was trying to kind of talk to people to get their insight. I'm also trying to get people to talk to me about some of these other kinds of uses uh, of the community, like this community patrol that uh, folks in the neighborhood had put together because again, there had been so much vacancy and so much desolation as folks were waiting for the highway to come that in some parts of the community, things got dangerous. And so here in Jamaica Plain, uh, uh, three people, actually there were four people, the fourth person is not there, 
uh, deputized themselves as a community watch, as a patrol. They got uniforms. Uh, they got uh, maps, and they went out. And so what you see is me on Facebook, this is like a billion years ago, trying to figure out uh, who these people are and if anyone can tell me the story. And so you see me at the top saying, does anyone know who this is? And Taffy Roberson says, I know Sam, he's my husband. Yeah, he's still around. So um, very helpful in terms of methodologically involving the community to try to help me understand the story, what was happening not just at the state house or not, not just um, with the governor, but what was happening in the community as people were trying to see what would happen um, to their land. Uh, and so this is another example of me uh, talking with a community activist, an organizer, who is also an architect, Ken Kruckemeyer, who's talking to me in our interview about some of the, the, the statements that he made to before the, uh, the House Committee on Urban Affairs, which is a standing committee um, in the legislature. And uh, you can't really make it out, which is okay. But he's basically drafting this speech. And through the speech, he is uh, explaining the impact that this road would have on him um, and his neighborhood of the South End. And what I was able to understand was the way that these movement makers were so tactical, so thoughtful and careful about trying to craft their messages. And for me, as a researcher, how important it was to try to be in, not just in conversation, but be in people's living rooms, in their basements, in their archives, sort of moving in and out of materials and uh, methods and modes of evidence to try to tell a story that could not just be told uh, by looking at newspaper headlines. This is Charles Bell, who is another neighbor from a nearby public housing development, who is talking to me about the way that the neighborhood looked before the road was coming and his family's experience in the city. And so through these kinds of interviews and discussions, I, I came to understand not only what was at stake for people, but also their sense of connection to a city that all but forgot them at a really important time. I think a lot of times in the 1950s and 60s, we can think about urban history as a sort of uh, just a crisis point, that it's, it's terrible, there's nothing to, to talk about except for destruction, because so much of the story becomes a suburban history in the United States at this time. If we have the willingness um, and the commitment to talk to people about what their communities look like during this time, I think we would be astonished, as I was in terms of the, the level of, of, of story, of investment and vision that actually exists in a lot of neighborhoods that were bypassed. A lot of the story I spent trying to find a picture of this trailer, uh, which was put on land that was cleared, land that had been cleared for the highway. Uh, the, the Boston chapter of the Black Panther Party uh, pulled out, uh, found this white trailer and put it on this land and set up a, a, a health clinic for the community. Uh, there was a, 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 a member of the party who was the, the chief of education for the party, and he had been a, a student at Harvard, and he was pursuing medicine, wound up dropping out, and procuring some um, contents to, to basically stock up this trailer. And so they have to talk to him about what the experience was like to provide uh, a, a health care um, and actually um, some doctors and nurses who were, who were coming in to provide people in the community with, again, um, health care that they had not been receiving. So this is yet another example of folks who were living in a space that had been cleared by the highway saying, we don't need to, one, we don't need a highway. Two, we have very clear ideas about how this land can be used. And not only do we have ideas, but we're going to execute on those ideas. We are going to practice planning. We are going to practice this kind of wholeness, wellness, and future vision of what a city can and should be um, and so I was very grateful to um, find this image just by giving talks like this. Um, and then it was shared by a community organizer, Armani White. Unfortunately, I did not find this image um, as I was researching the book. And so those of you who who read the book, or if, if you want to read the book, you can. But you'll hear me chapter after chapter actually looking for an image of this trailer. So um, it is definitely for me, every time I look at this image, it is a... Uh, 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 an affirmation of believing in the evidence or believing in the stories, even if you can't quite put your fingers on it right away. So uh, all this is going on in the ground. Um, they're able to completely change the governor's mind. Again, Francis Sargent cancels the road. 
So this image of what the proposed inner belt would have been like, um, which is on your left side, showing this eight to 10 lane highway coming right through the city of Boston, snaking its way to Cambridge, snaking its way over to I-93. This image is, is notable for a couple of reasons. One, uh, because whenever highway planners uh, draw images of uh, roads, there's never any traffic. Right? The roads are always amazing. They look wonderful. There's never a rush hour. There are trees. It looks wonderful. It's a fanciful image. So it's notable for that, but it's most notable because it was never built. And so uh, this is a celebration of what did not happen. And what was created in instead was a linear park. You see some images of me showing you what that land was turned into, a 4.7 mile linear park that uh, connects many neighborhoods in the, in the heart of Boston right now. You can uh, ride your bike there, you can, uh, you can walk, you can actually get in some gardens, there are tot lots there, and there's a new train. So the Orange Line train that you have there was dedicated in 1987, and this park was also dedicated in 87. So a, a tremendous story. Folks were able to go to Washington and get federal funding, and uh, create something that was called uh, the Boston Transfer Provision, which is part of the 1973 Federal Highway Act. This provision would allow uh, cities and states to tap the federal government, to, 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 to tap the treasury, to get money for mass transit. There had never been any such money, if you can believe that, it's crazy, right? So even though Boston was not the first city to kind of protest and try to stop a road. There are many cities that were first to this fight. Boston was late to this party. San Francisco was out in front, even New Orleans. Boston was late. But Boston as a city that was able to defeat its road is notable because it used that energy to go to DC to lobby Congress for this federal transfer provision. And that is how we're able to get a new mass transit. That's how many cities and towns across the country were able to get, again, public money for mass transit. It also resulted in about 343 miles of federal interstate roads being removed from the federal register as a knock-on effect of what Boston was able to do in Washington. So we have a little bit of braggers' rights on that. But the story uh, is not quite done here. And the question I had for many of the people that I interviewed, and even as I was looking through the archive, was, uh, was this a success? So based on what I have shared with you and what you're seeing, would you call this social movement a success? That is a question. I will take hands. Success? Maybe a poll. How many of you would say, yes, this is a success? Hands up. How many of you would say, no, this was not a success? It's OK. No judgment. How many people say they don't know? You're in the middle. Couple shy people. Most of you said this was a success. If, they, if, their, if their point was to go ahead and stop an interstate highway system, they stopped it. They got a train. They got a park. They got great. Um, and so I asked that to people who were organizing. And I asked them, did you feel like you won? And so many of the organizers and the activists said that they were ambivalent. Can you believe that? I was like, H -h what? No, no, no. No, you can't be ambivalent. You, you stopped it. You did. You didn't think you could, and you won. You said you didn't, you know. And they said, you know, what we didn't realize was that by stopping this road, we didn't think that we would be hastening gentrification in a part of the city that has a train, that has a beautiful outdoor space, and all of the housing around this 4.7 mile park is now susceptible to gentrifying forces. Unexpected. So then what do you do with that? So um, basically, the fight continues. So this is uh, a headline from the community paper in 2018 that is basically talking about the fact that the city of Boston is now trying to develop some of these empty parcels of land. So the clearance that happens in, the, in Boston in the 1960s in particular left lots of vacant parcels, like how I showed you the, the image of Carmen and the community looking at uh, working on the community garden. Lots of those parcels remained empty for 40 and 50 years in 2018. In the midst of a new mayor, 
uh, this, all of a sudden there is this economic discussion about what to do with these parcels. At this time, I am the director of economic policy and planning uh, for the city. Uh, and so I work on these parcels and trying to figure out how do you do development in a way that one does not displace people, but also return some of the economic benefit of land that had been cleared and, and, and taken from people um, and put it back into productive use. So there you see a community meeting. Uh, that's how communities meeting look, community meetings look. They're tough. Um, and you can see me in the way back. I didn't even realize. I'm standing in the back looking at this meeting because I am now sort of in this policy mode trying to figure out what can we do? Have we, have we actually been able to not only move a conversation that was historic, but include the community's feedback on how the request for proposals for these parcels can be, um, can be exacted. And so this is um, very much ground zero for thinking about not just the past, but the future of this land. And I think my, my journey has been a little bit unusual uh, because as, I, as was shared in my intro, I have been this person who's been inside the academy and inside government and sort of back and forth. And so trying to figure out how do you help the community to realize its own vision, not just because something was stopped, but especially if activists and organizers are telling me that they do not think they won because what they really wanted was economic benefit for community. It was never about a road. It was about a new kind of vision for revitalizing a community that had been neglected. And so that work continues and continues to call. And so this is why this other piece for us um, is to be noted that the past clearly is never dead. It's not even past. And so all of the, the, the learnings that have been pulled forward for me have to do with how do you raise up collective memory um, as a way to understand not only direct actions, but a way to think about future planning for and in a community. And so one of the things that I had done as a result of this work was to think about pulling many of these activists back together into conversation. Not only did I interview them and I worked on this book, but we are a city that is still um, struggling, that is still trying to understand what is our true north, uh, not only socially and economically, but generationally. And so uh, one of the things that we did is we did a reenactment of the 1969 People Before Highways Day. We marked the 50th anniversary of People Before Highways Day by bringing people back into the state house. And so we had hoped to bring 50, 40 or 50 activists. It wound up being more than 100 people, many of them who had been uh, there in the state house on that day. Um, and it has turned into a larger project of mine uh, which is really about mining these kinds of stories, mining these kinds of actions for current plans, current strategies, and current directions for the city. So I just have a couple more things to share with you, and I know um, I'm, I'm near time. But there's also, also a larger kind of issue that's here, which is trying to understand the way that the archive itself can limit how we understand stories. We need to talk to people. We need to kind of live into not only the present, but what the future can be. And so if I think about the archive, and so my archival uh, exploration has really challenged me to understand that the archive often, as we know, is, is, is a site of containment, erasure, um, and exclusion, particularly for many activists in their histories and stories, veteran activists, folks who have been at this for a while, like folks who are in that picture who are 70 and 80 years old, uh, and then also new activists. And then also concerned about the way that uh, the archive itself has this kind of a uh, ladder, a way of ranking information for activist communities of uh, lots of content like uh, buttons, uh, t-shirts, flyers. These things are called ephemera. That's their, their, their classification by the Library of Congress. Ephemera exists at the very bottom of this kind of um, hierarchy of information. So if you're a researcher or if you're someone that cares about activist stories, uh, I want to know how can we trouble that and how can we get access to knowledge that communities need as they build forward. And then this last point, trying to think about the ways that these fragmented social networks um, that exist because of land change often um, and the ways that cross-generational knowledge shared, um, that's shared among communities has to be understood, has to be repaired, that uh, wealth generation extraction which highway development is a conversation about wealth creation, 
but it's also pulling wealth out of communities. How can these large scale land use problems and projects be an opportunity for us to rethink how communities share their knowledge and to offer repair? And so this is some of what uh, this project that I've been working on called Hacking the Archive is about. Uh, is imagined as a participatory research project that is looking back 50 years uh, into the 60s to imagine the next 50 years. This project is imagined as a 100 year study and an opportunity to think in the city of Boston, but in other places as well, about the archive as a method, a way of thinking about time and place, also a mode, a way of understanding that the past is not past, that it's current, it's present, it's moving. Uh, and then there, obviously there's a materiality to what the archive is, whether it's papers, whether it's t-shirts, whether it's uh, actual um, notes or images. How are we marshalling these uh, to, for ways that actually prepare, revitalize, and restore communities from the inside out? And so we've done this through crowdsource activities, through very MIT things like hackathons, um, which is interesting to think about a hackathon as a creative problem solving opportunity for a community to think about its own questions, to use the archive as a way of answering some of those questions that are not just past, but looking forward, and how can spaces of, 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 of imagination and possibility be held and institutionalized. That is what is so damaged and so vulnerable in these kinds of large scale projects that I know about uh, probably all too well. And so I think what I will leave you with is an invitation to think about um, something that is asking us to imagine and to not just remember what progressive activists um, have done or have offered, but that many of them are still here connected through this vital web of stories that are not just about Boston and not just about Philadelphia, but oftentimes link our places, link cities in North America, link cities around the world. And what is it that we can do to preserve and think about those networks, whether it's through something like a reenactment at a state house, or it's through a hackathon, which we've had on campus, bringing back some of these folks to meet with students and younger activists, or our next piece of work, which has been really taking on the racial wealth gap as on the other side of these large scale infrastructure projects that are often trying to amass wealth and again extract wealth at the same time. We had this hackathon uh, this year where we brought people together to think about housing, to think about what's needed. Um, we're happy to bring lots of some of these activists uh, out who were at this other event that we had on campus, but with young people really front and center. Um, and trying to push not just what we think the archive or what universities can tell us, but really trying to lean into, again, on the ground, indigenous stories, stories from home, stories from basement, stories from people who have lived these things, and try to figure out a way to make those connections. And so for me, when I look at this uh, rendering of the inner belt and in, in what it was, I mean, how people were so successful and effective in defeating this interstate and defeating what would have been an additional 200,000 cars in the middle of the city would have choked out so many people who live right in its way and actually displaced the rest. I see not the dotted lines anymore. I see a living memorial to citizen power. I see a living memorial to what it means to take control of community and also think about that from a planning perspective um, and to make real for themselves uh, what could be. And when the activists and the organizers, and I mentioned this when they said to me that they did not feel that they had won, um, that lets me know and reminds me and reminds all of us that the work is still before us. What is the way to bring these local knowledges, these local capacities to bear? Um, that is not just about a fancy planning department or a fancy degree, which we all have and can talk about, but is really trying to be in true partnership and concert with folks who are living the consequences of many of the decisions that we make in rooms like this. So very happy to be here with you in community and solidarity because I know you are not afraid. So look forward to your questions and thank you.
Mm -hmm. do, 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 thank you for the question. Do you have an insight on that? Better when you're the question. Yeah, you, you seem it? like you might have an insight. Can you rephrase the question, please? Oh. Oh, so she can hear it for that. Okay. Also, yeah. Can you rephrase it? Can I? I no. Okay. <laughs> I cannot. Okay. Do you need a mic? No, no, no. You had, um, I don't think you have a travel mic. That this one? Did. Yeah, it didn't go on when I. A green light, but that's it. Oh no. I have lots of mics. I wish I could give you one. <laughs> uh, she was asking if you could rephrase the question at all. But try, give us another give us another stab and I'll try to rephrase. So my question is how do you um, give citizens sovereignty when they have the mechanisms? Did you hear? Yes. So I think that the question is essentially, how do you give people the word choice of sovereignty or a sense of, of personal power or, or, or actually collective power in the face of new funding uh, mechanisms and opportunities that are expanding roads? So I think two things. One, it's notable to me that uh, particularly with the Infrastructure Act and, and Secretary Buttigieg, what's happening in terms of trying to repair communities that have been devastated by highway expansion. Um, this has been quite contentious because I think, well, obviously, the original vision for what that funding could be, the scope and scale of it was, uh, was tremendous, right? We're talking about multiple, multiple, multiple billions of dollars that this, the, the federal government was trying, was thinking about investing in local communities that has been whittled down to a fraction of that. But what is notable is that there has never been a Secretary of Transportation and certainly not a president who had stood um, in the town square and talked about structural racism or white supremacy as a thing to think about in a policy sphere, and certainly not in the context of roads. So I, I think we're in a very interesting moment, even though the funding, again, has been, um, has been whittled down to, to nearly nothing in terms of the original vision. I do feel like that there's a different kind of conversation in this country in terms of what road building looks like and its impacts. And it's not just a feeling, but also uh, marked by the, the policy that goes with any kind of transportation planning now. In fact, it's the Department of Transportation um, that is so notable in this 1960s moment of, of really creating a new high watermark for environmental impact planning and making sure that any kind of federal, large scale federal plan or infrastructure project has an environmental impact component. That is very different. My concern actually is, is more with road building that we see in China and in India, um, and even in Egypt, at the time just having this conversation more recently before this week anyway, where there is um, a fascination in the world with the interstate highway system in the United States. And, and very much like you're saying, a commitment to building more and more and more roads without actually taking in the cautionary tales that comes with our history. So a lot of the concern that I have actually is about kind of how this information and how this experience and lessons are being extrapolated. Um, but I do think here the discussion is, is, is different. But I think if I had this conversation um, in Syracuse or even in uh, New Orleans people would have something else to say. So those battles still continue. It's true. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, now that there might be money actually to remove these highways, uh, what type of framework should we look to kind of rebuild uh, over these highways? Uh, what should we, how could we like reuse this land for the communities that were lost and maybe to prevent uh, other negative effects of yeah. Did you? I tried to ask before. Did you have a point? Did you have a thought on that yourself? Um, it, it's kind of hard to say. Um, uh, right now, I'm in this video about Camden, and many of the citizens that got displaced are no longer in the county or in the state. So right. it's kind of hard to say. Yeah. Who deserves that land? Exactly. Right. And so I asked the question because I know that from looking at the cases in, in Rochester, in Akron, um, there are a whole bunch of cities where you have mayors uh, making a decision to, to actually depress a road, to decommission it in some way. And you're exactly right. The question is, 
how do you how do you decide what to do? Um, and I think this is where my other hat comes in after having been the chief of equity for the city. And so in, in that kind of in that role that I had, my job was to help the city of Boston and its 60 departments and so define equity and to move the city's planning and regulatory processes to looking at outcomes. So how do you think about how do we think about disproportionate outcomes and effects of policies or something like roads? or um, particularly in the COVID moment, where I feel like during the pandemic and certainly during the lockdown, anyone who was in a policy position or anyone who was governing was being forced to see the disproportionate effects of the impacts of COVID. And so it raised up this question around equity and tried to and made sure we were making a distinction between equity and equality. If equality is treating everyone the same, which is its own thing, Equity is very much about looking at outcomes. What happens at the end? How do you get everyone to, this, to the same outcome in terms, in terms of wellness, in terms of safety, in terms of well-being? In your question, in terms of, of, of road building or road impacts, that is very much a place for people to bring in an equity framework. So you're actually having a very different conversation about how, it's, how it is affecting those populations. Your example of Camden is, is incredible, right? Because you're saying, how do you do repair work for a community that is not there anymore? Similar to this example of the West End I shared, the, uh, the 15,000 people in that community that were displaced, they have been working for many years now. They have a newsletter, they have a way of, of trying to have a reunion, but they have no land, they have no neighborhood. And so this is, a, this is a moment of reckoning in terms of not only how we think about transportation or infrastructure spending, but what is the policies that are on the books that actually can look at the equity outcome. Um, and that is the conversation. Whether we're having a full-blown conversation about something like reparations or not, or in addition to, that is also a conversation that's asking for people to take seriously the outcomes and the negative effects of these kinds of policies and withholdings. Thank you. One more. Hi. Mm -hmm. Do you do you have an insight on that? The question is around how people in the 1960s and 70s mobilized as opposed to now. Yeah, younger folks, meaning um, 18 belt relatives. 18. Mm -hmm. 1824, yeah. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you a personal question? Slightly, who knows? Do you believe in government? Wow. <laughs> I'll take that as a no, kind of, like not really, under some conditions, right? So I ask it that way, and thank you for your question, and thank you for letting me provoke, is because um, a, a lot of folks don't believe in government for good reason. And I, I was one of them, but I was in government, which made it really difficult for me. Um, there are a lot of reasons why we would not believe in the power or efficacy of government, uh, particularly when we look at the history that has laid waste uh, entire communities and continues to do so. So um, a, a question for me is, 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 is do, do you believe in government? And is there something that government can be doing that's different? Um, and again, as someone who really has deep skepticism of government's effectiveness, I, I wear that. When I went into uh, government as a director of economic policy for the city, um, I, I said no at first to that job because I didn't believe and I, had, I, I felt similar. I was like younger then. I felt like people were trying to get my vote and they, they promise you things and they don't deliver. 
And then I realized that I was basically saying no um, when that, we can't all say no every time. For me, the bottom line was um, in a city like Boston where uh, the operating budget then was $3.6 billion. And I looked at that number and I realized that that number represented uh, my family's taxes and our neighbor's taxes. And we don't have a lot of money as a family or in my neighborhood. And that there was so much money on the table that people were making decisions in our name and with our dollars. And when I started to think about it that way, um, it really changed my perspective um, and made me finally say yes to the job. Because I said, well, you know what? It's irresponsible for me um, as someone who believes that change is necessary um, and, it, and it's owed to people to say no because I do not believe the apparatus can live up to what it should and often it does not. But if I say no, and if you say no, and if everyone says no, then there's no possibility of any kind of anything else. So um, I think it is right to be skeptical of, of government and politicians, um, and it is right to, to, to own that that actually is in our names and is for us. And it's at that level of conversation that I think um, not, not change is possible. I wouldn't say that to be trite, but that the, the tension. They were pushing that struggle into reality, um, and that's needed. I teach a, a public policy class this semester, so thank you for letting me ask you that again, because I definitely asked that in class, and I'll be asking that in class tomorrow, in fact, so thank you. Yeah. Please join me again in thanking you.